Uh oh, well that didn't sound very good. Hopefully that's a bit better. All right, afternoon everyone. Let us get started now on the wonderful world of carbohydrates and saccharides. Now, a um, bit of a, a heads up guys. Uh, where are we? I did have my calendar open. Here we go. Um, Next week, you guys will have your uh, second course quiz, uh, which will be held online. Um, so what we'll do is we'll we'll smash through this lecture content, um, and then we'll um, during the shoot workshop we'll we'll have a bit of a chat about the um, uh, the course quiz uh, tomorrow. Uh, sorry, next week rather, uh, and we'll have a chat about your second assignment. Okay, because all of these things are sneaking up on us very very quickly. Uh, let me turn that off. Okay. Um, as per usual, guys, I will be keeping an eye on the, uh, on the chat to the side. I was testing it before. I think it's around two, uh, two seconds or three second delay. So, uh, hopefully nothing, nothing too bad. Um, but yeah, so if you got any questions or anything like that, please let me know. <coughs> okay. So let us get started. Wow, look at the change in the list of the learning objectives. They are way, uh, like much fewer than what they were uh, uh, over the past couple. Um, so we're going to be taking a bit of a, a bit of a break from proteins. Uh, I, I know that you're all shattered about that. I know you're all very broken hearted because uh, we spent so much time on proteins. Uh, so now we're going to be having a look at some sugars. We're going to be looking at uh, various isometric, um, oh, sorry, isomeric forms of um you know, of various organic compounds. Um, we're going to be looking at what, what it means by an epimer and diastereomer and all these wonderful other words. We're going to be looking at the um, cyclization of various monosaccharides. So looking at um, the single sugars and looking at how they um, change their, their structure slightly. Uh, we're going to be looking at what a reducing sugar is. Um, I do have a couple of YouTube videos that will help with that, but we might uh, we might save that one for the the tute workshop. Uh, and then basically what the game plan will be is that we will start, uh, actually, let me go over here. We'll start zoomed in and we will look at just single um, uh, sugars. We'll look at single uh, saccharides. And then what we'll do is we'll begin to zoom out. And that's when we'll start looking at these sort of key oligosaccharides and, and polysaccharides and look at how um, they, they vary in terms of their, uh, their function. So let's let's hook into it, shall we? Let's get started. So carbohydrates, how do they get that name? Because essentially they follow this formula of C N H two O N. So obviously the number of carbons changes depending on the on the sugar, but that's that's where we uh, we get the name carbo carbon hydrate because uh, of water. Uh, now in plants, obviously it's uh, produced from carbon dioxide and water. Okay, it's uh, using using light. Uh, we do not have such luxury. Um, we have many different metabolic ways in which we can um, synthesize various sugars or various carbohydrates, um, as well as relying on ingesting various carbohydrates in our in our diet. Um, now. The size of uh, carbohydrates and the size of sugars vary enormously, very enormously. So we can have sort of glyceraldehyde, which can have a molecular weight of 90 grams per mole versus um, amylopectin, which we're actually going to talk about at the end of today's lecture, can be, you know, uh, 200 million grams per mole. So yeah, a, a wide, huge scale, which again, we're going to deconstruct. Um, and, and this makes sense too. when we start looking at the variety of functions um, that, that carbohydrates can do. We're all familiar with this first one, okay? That it is a, an energy source and use as a short-term energy storage in the, uh, in the, lever, uh, in the lever, ah, in the liver rather, the liver and uh, skeletal muscle. Uh, however, it also does play a, a very important structural component. Um, it's also used a whole lot in um, in our cells, uh, especially in like cell receptors and sort of cell cell signaling and uh, and stuff like that. Uh, which that's where uh, things get uh, really off the rails. Um, and indeed, we we have uh, buildings dedicated to just researching. Um, sugars. So uh, at Griffith, there's a, a building called the Institute of Glycomics, and, and that's what they do. They look at sugars. Oh, excuse 
Excuse me. Now, here we're looking at, um, as I said, sort of the, this, this general formula. Um, and what we do is when we're looking at, at these um, sort of saccharides, these monosaccharides, um, we can classify them based on their uh, carbonyl group at the, at the top here, whether it is an aldehyde or whether it's a ketone. Uh, so for any of you who are studying, um, well, not so much are studying, but for those of you who have already uh, finished uh, math 1B, uh, sorry, uh, Chem 1B rather. Man, I'm getting all sorts of tongue tied today. Oh my goodness. Uh, for those of you who've done Chem 1B, uh, it probably wouldn't hurt for you to go back and do a little bit of revision just with your functional groups, just so you don't get yourself, uh, like me right now, getting, getting myself all tongue tied. <laughs> okay, now here we have some of the most commonly occurring uh, and, and commonly seen monosaccharides. Do you need to have all of these memorized? Absolutely, yes. No, nah, not really. I'm just, I'm just messing. You guys don't need to have all of these memorized. Uh, there is only one that I would, uh, I would expect you guys to have memorized, and that is glucose. Okay, glucose is, uh, is the big one. Um, what I will be uh, trying to do is uh, sort of uh, compare uh, and contrast all of these to glucose. That's going to be the main one. And that one I absolutely will expect you to uh, to memorize. Uh, I would expect you to know the structure of this and be able to draw it as well. Uh, very important. Um so as as we see, it sort of has the same um, general sort of, formula, um, uh, but what is mainly changing here is obviously the number of carbons. So we've got, you know, three, four, five, and uh, six carbons down here. Now, as I was explaining over here, how we've got um, these monosaccharides and they can be either um, an aldehyde uh, or a ketone. Uh, in, sorry, in the same way that we were looking at our aldehydes over here, so we can see our, our um, aldehyde group at the top here, we also have our ketones. Um, the, the aldehyde ones are going to be the ones I'm going to be referring to uh, the, the most often, uh, the most often though. Uh, okay, um, so one thing to keep in mind here is, of, of course, our stereoisomers. Um, so stereoisomers, oopsies. So when we're looking at our stereoisomers here, um, it's essentially referring to the same number of carbons, but in a different um, uh, arrangement in, in 3D space. And there's a, there's a nifty little way that you can um, calculate and determine the um, number of stereoisomers that can be formed from one particular uh, molecule, in this case, our, our monosaccharides here. Um, so the rule of thumb that we use is N equals two. Um, or, or sorry, two to the power of N, when we're looking at the number of chiral carbons. Now, remember, a chiral carbon is a carbon that is bound to four different groups. So if you're comparing one carbon um, here, we can see that this carbon is bound to X, hydrogen. Now, don't fall in the trap of saying, oh, it's bound to a carbon, it's bound to a carbon. Therefore, it's non-chiral. That's wrong, okay? It's bound to four different groups. Sorry, let me zoom in a bit. There we go. And that is we have our central carbon here is bound to X. It is bound to a hydrogen. It is bound to a methyl group and is bound to sort of the rest down here. So that is four uh, distinct and separate groups. Therefore, that is chiral. So... Um, our monosaccharide here has uh, two chiral carbons, therefore um, two to the power of N, because we have two, it's two to the power of two, which is four, meaning that we have four different um, stereoisomers. Okay, now um, stereoisomers. When we have our, our um, little letters at the front here, what we need to really keep in mind is that R and S is not the same thing as saying D and L. So R and S is, that's our basic nomenclature for looking at stereoisomers. So that's looking at, you know, same atoms, but different, um, different arrangement or different positioning. Um, however, D and L is uh, used to separate between enantiomers. 
So in antimers are non-superimposable mirror images. I ah, thought I had that in the next slide. That's okay. Uh, let's do this. Here we go. So uh, what do we mean by that, by an enantiomer? So let's look at our hands just as a good example. My hands are the same. I have four fingers, I have one thumb, and I have a palm. My hands are, in essence, identical. But what is happening here is that they are a mirror image, and that is if I had a mirror that was right down the center here, like so, they are a perfect mirror image. But when I try to superimpose them, my thumbs don't line up. And that's what we mean by an antima, okay? These are non-superimposable uh, mirror images. Now, when we are looking at this, a good way, uh, uh, I found this cool little flowchart as well. Um, I would expect you all to know um, what these different isomers mean and be able to identify them. So a good example here is looking at two compounds. We go, okay, do they have the same molecular formula? In other words, are they comprised of the same atoms? If no, then straight away, they're not an isomer. Um, however, if they are, we look at them and say, look, do they have the same um, connectivity? So if they don't, they can still be an isomer, but they're just called constitutional isomers. So that would be uh, looking at the, the aldehyde and a ketone. So we can see that they, they do have the same uh, molecular formula. They've got the same number of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens. Uh, however, they are ordered and arranged differently. So they've got different functional groups in this case. Um, now that separates our constitutional isomers. Um, if however, they are arranged in the same order but are different in terms of the 3D space, that is a stereoisomer. So then we go down to our little list here and we have our enantiomers, which I just explained before. These are our non-superimposable mirror image. So like I showed with my, with my hands, um, if they are not superimposable, then it basically means that they are um, enantiomers. Now, again, I would expect you all to at least be able to um, determine the differences between constitutional isomers, uh, looking at your enantiomers and looking at epimers and, and, and animas, which we're going to talk about these ones in a, a little bit more depth in a, in a moment. Now, something we're going to be looking at here is a Fisher projection. We're going to be looking at the Fisher projection for, um, for our, um, our, our, not our lipids, our, our saccharides, sorry. Um, and it's, it's just a very good, simple, easy way for us to represent a 3D structure. But what is important here is that when we're looking at our D and our L designation here, um, the best way to determine whether, um, we have a sugar that is in, that is D enantiomer or an L enantiomer is, is the following. So we do have a convention when we're writing uh, or drawing the Fisher projection of, um, of a sugar. Uh, so what we'll do is we sort of have our, um, our aldehyde at the, at the top here, and we have our carbons down uh, in, a, in a nice row down in the center. And what we do is you go to the very bottom carbon, right down here, and then you just go one up. And you look at which way that hydroxyl group is pointing. If it's pointing to the right, it's D. If it's pointing to the left, it's L. So a good way to remember that, L for left. So again, if we're comparing two um, enantiomers here, so think of it like left hand and right hand. If we're comparing two enantiomers, we look at the second lowest or the second from the bottom carbon. We look at which direction that hydroxyl group is pointing. If it's pointing to the left, it's L. If it's pointing to the right, it's D. Uh, that will be important um, when we, we talk further about these monosaccharides. Uh, 
okay, so I've basically already um, gone through that. That's okay. Um, so again, that's what we were looking at here with our enantiomers. So again, we look down at our carbons, second from the bottom. We can see this hydroxyl group is pointing to the left, therefore it is L. Now you will notice over, over here with our uh, epimers and our animas that they sort of separate out. And this is kind of the, the bottom, bottom of the list. Okay, if we haven't filtered it out yet, we've got, uh, we've got these two. Now epimers. Epimers will um, be a molecule that is different at one uh, sort of key section uh, of the of the molecule, and it means that they're not a mirror image. And it, it can be interesting because it can actually have a a, a a very strong effect in terms of the uh, chemical properties of uh, of these molecules. So, looking at our epimers and looking at our animers. Um, epimers is a configuration or a change around one carbon. So for instance, if we've got glucose, which is our main sugar that we're going to be looking at, we're going to be referring to. If we compare glucose and galactose, we can see we've got our aldehyde group at the top, aldehyde group, hydroxyl group is pointing to the right, to the left, to the right, but here it's on the left. It's changing at the fourth carbon. Okay, it's basically just, um, uh -oh, there we go. It's basically just flipped. It's it's rotated around. Um, and then from carbon five and carbon six, they're identical. So what you could, uh, you can say is that galactose is a C4 epimer of glucose. And it's the same with mannose. If we compare um, glucose and mannose, we can see it is an epimer at the second carbon. Okay, now the big diff, uh, here we go, that's better. The big thing here is that we were, um, when we're looking at the stereochemistry, we're looking at our stereoisomers, we were looking at epimers and animas. Now with our epimers, um, uh, and and looking at these um, uh, uh, enantiomers, what is happening there is it can be D or L. Okay, it's whether it's uh, the the second uh, from the bottom uh, hydroxyl group, whether it is pointing to the left or whether it's pointing to the right. That's all well and good um, when we are looking at the sugar in its open chain formed. However, what we also see with these monosaccharides is that they are in their cyclic form. Okay, or well, they will be in their Haworth projection. So in the open chain form, which is how we've been looking at these sugars thus far, this is them in their Fischer projection. And that's what we're looking at here. However, in, in the big bad real world, they can exist in their cyclic form, which is their Haworth projection. Is everyone, uh, is everyone all good so far? Everyone's, is it making sense? Everyone's okay? All right, hopefully we're all good. If you do have any questions though, guys, please, uh, please let me know. Now, let's look at our Fisher projection, but then try to wrap our head around how can we take our Fisher projection and rewrite it as a Haworth projection. Uh, the numbered OH groups, ooh, the numbered OH groups will be numbered or no? Ooh, Anthony, sorry, man, I don't quite understand what you mean by that, sorry. Um, I'll push on explaining this, uh, write out what you are referring to, and um, hopefully I can answer your question in a moment. Now, what we can see here is that our Fisher projection, it can turn into a Haworth or it can turn, uh, go into its cyclic form and then branch open again. On your Fisher projections, uh, you have one to six written on H and OH. Oh, you mean down here, like one, two, three, four, five, six? Uh, no, that won't be written um, for you. That uh, That's just sort of to help simplify things. 
but on exams, will we have to determine the different sugars or uh, will we be required to figure it out? Mm, good question. Um, I guess the different sugar, like I, I wouldn't say to you, like identify this sugar. You know, I, I wouldn't expect you to memorize like mannose and galactose and all of them. I've said to you, um, you only need to draw glucose or you only need to have memorized glucose. But how I could change that is say um, galactose is a C4 epimer of glucose. Draw galactose, for example. That's how I could sort of change or, or reword that. So here we're looking at D-glucose. This is in its Fisher form. How can we redraw that in a Haworth projection? There is a nice, uh, easy way uh, to do this. Uh, uh -oh, I want to do this one, sorry. Um, what's going to happen is I want you to picture like you're holding this sugar with your right hand uh, on the first carbon and your left hand on that uh, hydroxyl group in on the fifth carbon right down here. This is also the same one that we're, uh, that determined whether it is D or L. Then all you need to do is <laughs> take your sugar, rotate, oh God, I need to do it backwards because this is a mirror image. Uh, take your sugar, rotate it 90 degrees to the right, and then connect them together, connect your hands together as you're sort of pushing into the screen. I'm gonna do that again, cause that seems a bit confusing, okay? Uh, so first carbon, fifth hydroxyl group. You rotate 90 degrees to the right and then push into the page and join the dots. Now, the reason why I'm saying like one and five and sort of rotate to the right and push into the page, what? Yeah, okay, this, yeah, this one's a bit, a bit tricky. It makes it even harder to do because like uh, virtually. But what is essentially happening here is that when these single sugars are uh, turning into their cyclic form, what is going to happen is that the hydroxyl group, this oxygen from the, um, on the fifth carbon, is going to bind to the first carbon up the very top here. What that is going to do is essentially uh, disrupt or break this, this double bond. So that hydrogen is going to move up here. And it's then going to, to form a covalent bond and it's going to link together. That's what's being shown here. Now, this carbon here and this oxygen here is here. So hopefully the, the color coding here will, will help you guys out. Um, and this is how the D glucose as it exists in its cyclic form. Now, uh, so basically instead of writing carbon, it's represented by the hexagon corners. Um, look, that's just, again, that's shorthand because you can see down here in our Fisher projection, um, they haven't written the carbons either. Um, you can write the carbons in here. Um, uh, I, I would actually recommend you do that to help not make any any errors. Um, but what they've done here is just uh, is just shorthand. Uh, so again, to repeat, you get your sugar. Sorry, I'm gonna have to do it backwards. You get your sugar 90 degrees to the right and reach into the page and connect them together because it's here that they're connecting. Now, these are also numbered just to help you guys try and wrap your head around what's, what's happening here. We have six carbons, six carbons. Now, when you are counting or looking at your carbons with a Haworth projection of a sugar, what's incredibly important is a couple of things. One, this oxygen should always be pointing the top right. That's convention, okay? In the same way as like when we always wrote out our proteins, we always made sure like the quaternary ammonium group was on the left and the carboxyl um, group was on the right. The same thing here is that our oxygen 
that is within this high worth projection here is always top right. It's just a very good and handy way to make sure that we are looking at these things with the right perspective. Okay, I would expect you guys to be able to convert a, um, a, a Fisher projection to a Haworth projection and vice versa and be able to take a Haworth projection and redraw it as a Fisher projection. Oops. Um, now, actually, I'll come back to that. Now, what we're looking at over here is when we are looking at our um, various Haworth projections, we rotate it to the right and we can use that to basically check our, uh, our, our confirmations here. So for instance, if we're looking at glucose, glucose, we have our um, first carbon, uh, this is our anomeric carbon, which I'm going to talk about a little bit in a moment. And then if we say, look at our second carbon, it's pointing, uh, to the, to the, uh, pointing downwards, which means it's going to be pointing to the right. Now, if we are comparing this with mannose over here, we can see at that second carbon, it's now pointing to the left, uh, which means when we're looking at this Haworth projection, it's going to be pointing upwards. Now, I've already said to you guys that you need to be able to like, have the structure of glucose memorized. I'll teach you a little trick. And this is how I uh, have memorized it. Just picture down, up, down. Okay. Uh, so down, up, down. So why, why, does, why does that make sense? So... If you just draw a hexane ring with your oxygen in the top right hand corner, you write CH2OH and then down, up, down. And that's just indicating the direction of your hydroxyl groups. So that's, that's, a, that's a cool little sort of memory trick that you can use to help you um, remember the, the structure for glucose. Now, I didn't talk about this one. And the reason for that is that this one can change. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment when we start talking about animas. Now, when we're looking at these cyclic um, monosaccharides, when we're looking at them in their Haworth projection, it's important to keep uh, in mind that they can be drawn in uh, one of two main ways. We can draw them as a five member ring or as a six member ring. So if they are written as a four, uh, sorry, as a five member ring, they are known as a furanos. Uh, and if it is a six member ring, it is pyranose. So for instance, here, our, um, our glucose uh, can be drawn as D glucopyranose, or it can be um, written as uh, fructofuranose. Uh, so our furanose here, because it's a five member ring. Um, the big things I would just expect you to know here is just the, the difference in terms of uh, naming between furanose and pyranose. Uh, and that's that's pretty much it. Okay, now I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the cyclization of monosaccharides. Let me get myself out of the way here. Now, as I as I uh, very cheekily alluded to over here, um, I, I said with this. Um, anomeric carbon with, with this hydroxyl group and this hydrogen, I said it could either be pointing up or pointing down. And the reason for that is because of this chiral center called our anomeric carbon. And the uh, depending on which way that hydroxyl group is pointing will tell us what type of anima we are dealing with. So this is the, the last of our stereoisomers. Now, with our hydroxyl group, if it is pointing down, we refer to it as an alpha. And if it is pointing upwards, we refer to it as beta. So if I'm looking at this, 
Okay, alpha is pointing down, beta is pointing up. So this is beta D glucose. Now, a good way to sort of uh, remember that and, and uh, sort of wrap your mind around that, which uh, a student from, I think it was a year or two now, I can't quite remember, um, basically said that the way that she remembered it is that what sound do you make when you jump off a cliff? Ah! <laughs> So uh, if you're pointing downwards, like you're jumping off a cliff, you're falling down, then that is alpha. And if you're pointing upwards, it is beta. So there you go. There's always little, little tricks and, and ways around things in terms of memorizing it. Oh, come on, Anthony. You, ha you giggled a little bit, right? <laughs> oh, dear. Now, let's go through a foolproof way in which you can find this anomeric carbon because it is at this anomeric carbon that we can have a, uh, it can be pointing, like rotating around. So the hydroxyl group can, pointing, uh, can be pointing up or be pointing down. Uh, and it's also going to um, come into play when we're talking about our reducing sugars. So how do we find it? How do we find this anomeric carbon? The first thing we need to do is look for this oxygen. Now you can see here, this glucose uh, looks uh, all sorts of funky. Um, look, don't worry about that. Um, this is the more technical way of, of, of drawing it. Okay, you have like your chair and boat conf uh, confirmations. Um, I'm not going to go um, too much into that or in, uh, in any further detail with that. Um, so not to worry, this will be the main uh, sort of structure that I'll be referring to it as. So what do we do? We look for this oxygen and we basically look at both carbons bound to this oxygen. What you're going to do is look for the carbon that has that CH2OH. So if we look left, oh look, CH2OH, we're going to turn around and go, awesome, it is not that one. So again, got here, looking at this one, CH2OH, no. Wow, why is that yellow? My goodness. Yeah, no, it is not that one. So therefore, it is this one. That is our anomeric carbon. So again, to find it, look at that oxygen. Look both sides. If you see CH2OH, it is not that one. It is the other one. And I'm going to explain why uh, that is the case uh, in a moment, because I'm going to come back to that slide. So when we're looking at our animas and, and we are sort of trying to determine whether they are alpha or beta, again, we take our Fisher projection, we rotate it 90 degrees to the right and the hydroxyl group and this carbonyl carbon at the top here are going to bind together. And the and this is this is why we have this anima is that it could either be alpha or beta because this carbon carbon bond here between carbon one and carbon two is just a sigma bond. Uh, and what that essentially means is that it can freely rotate um, between that carbon one and carbon two. Um, so depending on how it is oriented, will determine whether it will be alpha or whether it will be beta. So this is uh, what I was just describing before, just on this slide. Now, what is also important to keep in mind here with these enantiomers is that they can change. Um, and, and it ultimately depends on the stability of, uh, you know, of this, uh, of this monosaccharide. So coming back here, we can have our, uh, say, beta D glucose. So again, we look at our glucose molecule. I look at that oxygen. I see CH2OH, no deal. It's this way. Which way is that uh, hydroxyl group facing? It is up the top. Okay, it's pointing up. So that means it is beta. Now, what can then happen is that the bond between this oxygen and this carbon can be disrupted. So this hydrogen is going to jump over. It's going to reform that aldehyde group. 
And during that period, when that uh, bond has been broken and it's reforming this um, uh, this aldehyde here in its open chain form, it can rotate. It can rotate and spin itself around. And then when it um, reforms, what will then happen is that uh, you know the, the carbon and the oxygen here will will bind, reform. This double bond will break, and then what's going to happen is it's then going to be pointing downwards and it's going to be in its alpha conformation. So ultimately what is happening here with our monosaccharide is that it can be um, either alpha or beta um, and uh, it can bounce between the two within an equilibrium, but it will um, typically have a preference or there will be more of one form than what there will be uh, uh, in another, purely due to which one is the most energetically uh, energetically stable. So hopefully that's uh, that's making making sense, everyone. Uh, 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 okay, let's do this. So when we're looking at these. Um, the names of these uh, uh, various saccharides. The big thing that we need to keep in mind here is alpha or beta. Now, these are uh, for cyclic um, uh, saccharides. So alpha or beta is looking at the anomeric carbon and looking at the position of that hydroxyl group. Then whether it is glucose or fructose, or whether it's a glucose molecule or a, um, or a fructose molecule, that's sort of these two examples that we're looking at here. And whether it is a uh, six-membered ring or whether it is a five-member ring. Um, so like beta D glucopyranose, just for example. Now, uh, how are we going here? Okay. What we are looking at now is, and something we still need to keep in mind, is that this, uh, these sugars, uh, especially when they are um, branching or changing from their uh, cyclic form to, the, or their Haworth projection to their Fisher projection, so their cyclic form to their um, open chain form, like we're seeing here. What is important to note is the reason why we look so closely at these functional groups is that that's where these reactions, uh, you know, chemical reactions tend to occur. And ultimately sugar is no exception to this. So because uh, these sugars contain either an um, aldehyde or a ketone, it means that they are, you know, capable of undergoing chemical reactions that will be seen within aldehydes and ketones. So, for instance, we can take this aldehyde and we can oxidize it and turn it into a carboxylic acid. Um, which, yeah, we can do that because uh, ultimately it does have that um, that group. It's just we need to um, uh, take advantage of that when it has that free uh, aldehyde group, which ultimately means we need to look at a reducing sugar. So... What do we mean by a reducing sugar? What we are looking at there with a reducing sugar is it is able to be, uh, it is able to function as a reducing sugar because of that free aldehyde group is able to, um, you know, reduce these uh, oxidizing agents, okay? And is able to react in the same way that we saw over here, okay? We can see our uh, glucose in uh, that, uh, uh, exposed uh, aldehyde group is being um, oxidized into our uh, 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 gluconic acid. So because of that, uh, it is considered a reducing sugar. Now let's let's try and put this um, into a, a little bit of, of context here. Now we've got uh, some YouTube videos. I'm not gonna show them here cause I'm worried it'll like crash, crash the stream or something like that. But we will watch these um, on the, uh, in the Tute Workshop. I also have them up on the Moodle uh, course page if you wanna check those out. So what we're looking at here, this part 
is representing the equilibrium between glucose in its um, in its cyclic form and in its open chain form. Now, this part here, that's what I was describing here. How it can, uh, how glucose or, you know, these um, monosaccharides, so just one sugar, how it can be um, in its, in its uh, closed cyclic form, but it will exist in an e equilibrium. So this bond will break, it will be in its open chain form, and then it will go back into its, its, uh, its cyclic form. That's what we're looking at here. But how this um, Fellings reaction um, works is that when the cyclic form of glucose will um, open up into its open chain form, that will then expose this aldehyde at the top. Now, once that aldehyde is exposed, it can then react with, um, with copper, obviously in, in an aqueous solution there, and it's going to turn this aldehyde into a, a carboxylic acid. Now, what is also important to, to um, take note of in terms of this reaction is this reaction here is not an equilibrium. So what is going to happen here is that this, uh, the, the glucose between the cyclic form and this uh, linear form are going to be in equilibrium. Then once open, this copper is going to react with this aldehyde and, um, you know, cause it to turn into a carboxylic acid. That is going to consume this reactant to create our product over here. Now, because then we are suddenly having less of our um, open chain form, that's going to push this equilibrium to the right because we are having um, fewer and fewer of this because this, uh, uh, this reaction here is not in equilibrium, which is gonna cause more of the glucose to uh, convert from its cyclic form into its open chain form, which will obviously continue until um, the reaction goes to, uh, goes to completion. So this is a cool little, um, uh, just a little visual example here. So this is from um, Nile Red. Um, he's a he uh, has a YouTube channel. He does some awesome, awesome, awesome chemistry videos. Um, I've got a, a lot of his stuff linked in the in the Moodle page. I recommend you, you geek out over it. He does some cool stuff. Um, but what he's essentially showing here is um, methylene blue and uh, glucose mixed up in this uh, in this water bottle here. Now, what he's doing is he's taking that methylene blue and shaking the hell out of it by uh, and causing a heap of oxygen to be um, pushed in and dissolved into, um, into that aqueous solution. And what that is essentially doing is um, pushing forward that reaction that we, that we were uh, going through on the previous slide, uh, which is corresponding to um, a, a strong color change. And that's what we're, we're sort of seeing here. Again, uh, we'll go through this in a lot greater detail and um, talk about it a lot more in the uh, during the tute workshops. Okay, now this is also where sugars can get a little bit uh, tricky because what we have been looking at here is uh, you know the just the straight. Uh, sort of basic form of uh, of saccharides. Oops, there we go. Uh, however, uh, sugars can also have many, many different derivatives. So um, a, a perfect example there is what we've been looking at over the past few slides, looking at this um, uh, glucuric acid. So looking at that D-glucose that, um, that has been reduced. So uh, that's obviously a, a derivative of that. Uh, we've got glucosamine, we've got uh, deoxy sugars, uh, like we see in our DNA. So um, yeah, gluc uh, 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 carbohydrates and saccharides uh, have a lot of different variations here, which again, we're going to explore a lot more when we look at the, um, when we look at these carbohydrates and these polysaccharides.
Okay. So, guys, we've gone through a heap of stuff at the moment. We've spoken a heap about these monosaccharides and looking at, you know, alpha and, and beta. And we looked at these reducing sugars and all that, which we're going to touch on uh, even more in a moment. But, look, I think we should have a quick five-minute breather, guys. Stand up, stretch your legs, um, grab a cup of coffee, uh, and we will push on with looking at disaccharides. Uh-oh. Oops. Oh, no. There we go. Hey, we're working again. Excellent. <clears throat> Alrighty, crew. Let's keep going. Let us push forward now. Um, we've spent a bit of time now looking at uh, monosaccharides and... Um, you know, uh, looking at like sort of different ways that we can draw them and how they can be um, sort of branching and rearranging themselves from their, uh, you know, cyclic form to their open chain form. Um, but now let's have a look at disaccharides. Now, disaccharides, um, in the exact same way that we can take our amino acids and join them together to form, um, you know, a dipeptide identical thing here. Now, what is also, uh, I guess we'll call it convenient for us as well, is that it's uh, actually the same reaction in that we see a hydrogen from one and we see a OH from the other. And what that's going to do is a condensation reaction here. And it's going to combine this oxygen with this carbon here to form what is called a glycosidic linkage. Okay, so this glycosidic linkage is what will hold these two sugars together. Now, uh, again, uh, some of these sugars do have um, different names, especially with the, when we're looking at our disaccharides. I don't expect you to memorize uh, any of the names of disaccharides. Um, if I was to um, give you anything that involved a disaccharide, I would tell you um, what they are. Now, um, one thing too, I should also point out that with sugars, it has the suffix os, O-S-E. So um, with our saccharides, if it ends in O-S-E, therefore we know it's a sugar. Now our naming convention here is that mono is one, di is two, tri is three, we already know this. Uh, oligo, uh, oligo means like a couple. It means uh, it's anywhere from sort of four to sort of 10-ish uh, around that mark, uh, like eight to 10. And after that point, we then refer to it as poly, poly meaning sort of many. Uh, this one, here we go. Um, now, this is just a, a further um, breakdown here of like drawing and identifying our glycosidic linkage. Um, now, what is also very, very important that we keep in mind here is we need to be aware of this oxygen up here. Now, why? Why do we need to look for this oxygen? Um, because it's important that we make sure that these, um, the glycosidic bond is in the right spot. And if we are not identifying or, or sort of drawing our, um, our sugars properly, then we can draw the bond in the wrong spot. Um, and, and the reason, sorry, I should also explain that. And the reason for that is that, um, here we are uh, drawing an uh, an alpha one four linkage. Now I'm going to talk about this uh, a little bit more uh, in a moment. But what that is essentially describing is that um, this alpha one four glycosidic linkage um, alpha because the uh, this hydrox group alpha it's pointing down, and one four it is an alpha um, bond between carbon one and carbon four. It doesn't necessarily have to be between carbon one and carbon four. We can have alpha one, two. We can have alpha one, six linkages. Um, it, it depends. There's a lot of diversity there in terms of the, the glycosidic uh, linkage. 
Now, what we were talking about before with these reducing sugars. Um, now, looking at a reducing sugar, all monosaccharides are reducing sugars. All monosaccharides have the ability to um, sort of go from their uh, closed chain form and break open and then rotate around in that open chain form and then reform that cyclic, uh, th their cyclic structure and, and sort of uh, bounce between alpha and, and beta. However, when we, I thought I had a different image here. Ah, oh, that's a damn shame. That's okay. Um, however, when we see a glycosidic linkage, it is no longer a reducing sugar. Now, let me, let me break down why that is the case. So here, what we're looking at is um, a monosaccharide. We're going to just pretend that they're not connected down here. Let me just sort of zoom. Uh, let me do this there. So let, let's, let's pretend that this is a, a simple OH group. Now, how is it that this is able to undergo muta rotation? And that is when that bond is broken and it's able to rotate around that sigma bond and then reform into that cyclic compound. Um, one, it forms a hemiacetal, but a, a, a maybe a more descriptive way of thinking about it is if we look at this carbon here, and we look at this connection to this oxygen, this bond is put under a lot of strain. And the reason for that is we've got the electronegativity of this hydroxyl group down here. So this is sort of putting some strain on this bond. We've also got this hydroxyl group here, which is, you know, very electronegative, and that's pulling electrons this way. So that's really putting strain on this uh, on this uh, carbon oxygen bond here. Now, we could look at it this way, but there's not as much strain uh, on, on these connections as what we have over here. And what can then happen is that this bond between this carbon and oxygen can break. And that's what we see with this muta rotation. However, if we just shimmy this way, if we have a look here, we look at this oxygen. Again, we can see our anomeric carbon. Is this going to be a reducing sugar now? Well, the answer is no. And because, uh, and sorry, and that is because of this glycosidic linkage. Yes, there is strain put on this oxygen and carbon bond, but what we're seeing here is the ability for resonance to occur. And that's when those electrons are moving around and it's becoming more stable. So in the same way that um, when uh, amino acids were joined together in a peptide, that quaternary ammonium group and that carboxylic acid could no longer contribute to the charge of a protein. You can think of it like the same way with glycosidic bonds. When uh, a sugar is uh, bound uh, or is involved in this glycosidic linkage, where it's... Um, uh, 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 where it is, uh, where its anomeric carbon is consumed, okay, then it can no longer act as a reducing sugar. So what I mean by that, this sugar molecule here, if it was by itself, it would be a reducing sugar. However, because it is involved in this glycosidic linkage, this part here is not a reducing sugar. Now we have the exact same sugar molecule, okay? We have glucose over here. Is this part here a reducing sugar? Yes. But hang on, you may say, well, wait, it's involved in this glycosidic linkage. You just said that means it's not a reducing sugar. But what we can see here, it is involved in a glycosidic linkage, but not at the anomeric carbon. This anomeric carbon is still free. And because this anomeric carbon is still free, this part here can still act as a reducing sugar. Okay, so now looking at these glycosidic linkage. Okay, when we're drawing it and when we're writing it out, the first thing that we need to do is when we are indicating our glycosidic linkage, we need to one, indicate whether it is an alpha or beta link. 
The second thing we need to do is then in, uh, in, indicate the carbons that are involved with that glycosidic bond. So uh, the one I've been referring to the most uh, in, this, in this video is alpha 1,4. So again, if we're looking at maltose down here, it is an alpha linkage because it's pointing downwards and is a connection between the first and the fourth carbon. Now, if we say look at um, Celebios down here, this is a beta 1,4 because if we look at this first anomeric carbon, it is beta because it's pointing upwards and it is connecting the first and the fourth carbon. Now we do also have a degree of uh, shorthand here. So when we're looking at um, uh, lactose, okay, it is galactose and glucose joined together. Now this is the full name, okay? So we don't use IPAC naming with, uh, with sugars, but this would be the sort of the full written out descriptive name of lactose. So beta D galacto paratocinal, uh, one four, cause it is, um, a one four. So you could also put beta one four, um, beta D, uh, gluco pyranose. Now that's not too bad. Okay. Cause we can just, again, break that down into chunks and looking at the structure, be able to discern that. Uh, we can also as shorthand, write it as gal beta one three, uh, sorry, beta one four GLC. So just be aware with glucose, we don't write it as GLU, okay? Because that's obviously glutamate, um, the, our amino acids. So instead we write GLC. Now, typically, uh, even with the, all this shorthand and stuff like that, I would still, um, I would expect you to know glucose being GLC, um, but any of the other ones I will provide to you. Okay, so an example question. Knowing that glucose is shortened to GLC, write the glycosidic linkage between these two glucose molecules below. Um, so we'll go through this further in the Tute workshop, but the big thing is with this question, everyone gets, uh, gets tripped up on it because it is an alpha 1-1 linkage. Now, how does that make sense? sense. What on earth just happened here? How, how, how on earth it is an alpha 1-1? One, one? Look at this oxygen. Okay. So we have glucose over here. We have our oxygen here. So carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Awesome. Now, if we look at this, what? Well, hang on, the oxygen's in the wrong spot. We can see that this glucose molecule is literally uh, here. It's, it's upside down. So if we're going to count the, the carbons for this, it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's one of my sort of uh, little uh, examples here of why it's always important when you're looking at these um, sugar molecules to always pay attention to whereabouts is that oxygen. Um, it's to help avoid um, sort of uh, blunders like this in terms of when we're looking at um, what type of glycosidic linkage we're, we're referring to here. Now this one uh, we're going to do, uh, we'll do that in the shoot workshop actually. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that um, a little bit more. Um, but essentially what I was uh, talking about in that previous slide with the example question is just looking at um, the degree of resonance that's going on between that uh, disaccharide and looking at that overall stability. Now, looking at um, glycosidic bonds, we can also have these um, like glycosidic bonds that are occurring um, uh, between our carbon and our amines. We see this in our DNA and RNA. I'm not gonna go too, um, too much further into, into this. Uh, but again, what we're seeing here is a great diversity in terms of the, uh, sorry, in terms of the, the structure of our sugars. And uh, as such, we're also seeing a diversity in terms of that glycosidic bond. 
Uh, where do I want to go? Let's go over here. Now, we have looked at single sugars. We have then zoomed out to look at, you know, disaccharides. We've looked at monosaccharides. We've looked at disaccharides. Now I want to zoom right, 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 right out to look at polysaccharides. These are also known as glycans. Um, I, I, I typically refer to it as just a polysaccharide. Um, and what we are essentially looking at here are um, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of simple repeating sugar molecules being joined together. So uh, the, probably the most common example that we would uh, see, especially in your uh, studies in science, would be glycogen. So glycogen is the short-term storage of uh, glucose in, in the uh, in the in the human body, and what we see here is glucose molecules connected together with occasional branching. Now, carbohydrates are insanely uh, complicated and very involved in terms of the sheer number of things they do in the human body. <clears throat> so a little analogy here is like, imagine that when we're looking at the cells in your house, <laughs> cells in your house, uh, <laughs> the cells in your body rather, um, Imagine that they weren't a cell, but they were a house. So your DNA is basically the the uh, the, the building plans. Okay, it's basically the instructions on here is how to build you. Here's how to build the cell. Now your proteins and your lipids and your carbohydrates and all these other sort of main macromolecules that we've been spending weeks and weeks and weeks talking about. These are the building materials. This is the the carpet. This is the wood. This is the plasterboard that basically build and hold your house together. Rad. However, carbohydrates kind of take it one step further. They are not only uh, like the help to construct your house. They're also the electricity. They're also the internet. There's also the phone line and, and your Wi-Fi and, and all of that sort of stuff. So it also plays a massive role in terms of um, structure, in terms of, you know, like sort of building your house. Uh, but it also plays a huge role in terms of um, energy and, of course, communication. Um, okay, so these are the main three roles. Again, uh, I've just finished talking about that. Now, looking at our uh, polysaccharides here, so our carbohydrates, essentially. We have a couple of different um, categories here. So what we see here is say a unbranched homopolysaccharide. So unbranched basically means it's linear. It has um, only one connection linking to it. It's not sort of um, uh, branching off. And it is a homopolysaccharide because homo means one, poly means multiple, and saccharide means sugar. So, um, so. Uh, same or, you know, one many sugars. That That's basically what it translates to. Now, of course, you can have branched homopolysaccharides and then you can have um, unbranched and branched heteropolysaccharides. And what you're going to be seeing in a moment is just the sheer, uh, the, the sheer amount of diversity uh, 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 that we see with, uh, with, with, with carbohydrates, with these polysaccharides here. So carbohydrates are the greatest source of diversity that we see in nature. So if we look at DNA and RNA, so it is four different nucleotides, these four different base pairs, although, I mean, we can argue five if we're going to include RNA, okay? If we're going to include that uracil. So it is uh, referring to say just DNA. We have four different molecules, Combined together in a various patterns and various arrangement that give rise to all the genetic diversity that we see, you know, on, on the planet. Just, it's insane. Then we look at proteins, okay? Uh, we've, we've been spending like six plus weeks looking at proteins. That is just 20 amino acids that are joined together in, in various combinations, um, however, what is important to keep in mind is that they are all bound together identically. Every single amino acid is bound together with another amino acid in the exact same way in that the, uh, that peptide bond is identical. Okay. Sugars, on the other hand, kind of just take it another, another step up. Not only do we have a huge variety of different types of sugars, we can then alter those sugars. 
So um, we, you know, we can uh, acetylate them. We can have like acetyl groups on there. Um, we can take these amine groups on there. So we can add these different groups. Like I was sort of showing, uh, whereabouts was I showing that? Ah, it's too far back. That's okay. Um, sort of all the different variants that we have of these sugars and how it even further diversifies that is that it doesn't always bind in the same spot. It could be an alpha 1, 4. It could be an alpha 1, 6. It could be an alpha 1, 1. It could be a beta 1, 6, beta 1, 4, beta 1, 2. It just all these different possibilities and all these different options are huge. And that is why there's so much diversity here when we're looking at these... Um, uh, various um, uh, carbohydrates. Now, just to uh, just to further clarify here in terms of that diversity, uh, let me jump up here. So, if we're looking at our two glycans down here, okay, we have the same distinct glycans that are bound, uh, sorry, uh, that uh, like the same number of the same sugars, yet they are different because they are bound in a different way. So instead of being um, beta 1, 4, this one is beta 1, 3, which means this would be different to this one, albeit sort of a, a very, very similar. Now, another thing too, which further compounds and further increases that complexity and diversity of these carbohydrates is that we can see what is called branching. And that is when we see this mannose sugar here, it has two sugars bound to it. It has both an alpha 1,3, well, technically it's got three sugars. It has an alpha 1,3 an alpha 1,6, and it is connected to the rest of the sugar via a beta 1,4 linkage. So what we're doing here is we're seeing this branching point and further diversifying, um, you know, uh, th this uh, these uh, polysaccharides. You know, you can't have an amino acid that is uh, participating in three plus um, peptide bonds. You know, that just, it just doesn't happen. And you don't have like an alpha peptide bond and a beta peptide bond. That doesn't make sense. But we do definitely see that when we look at carbohydrates. Now, do I expect you to memorize all of these and all the shorthand and blah, blah, blah? Absolutely not. No. Um, what I'm simply pointing out to you guys here is um, the, the sheer amount of variation that we can see with the sugars, not only in the structure of the sugar themselves or any sort of um, uh, variations in terms of the side groups that we put on these sugars, but also in terms of how these sugars are linked together. Okay, let's have a look at some examples now. Now, these examples I will expect you to know, um, but we'll, uh, they, they're not too bad, so we'll work our way through them. So let's have a look at the first of our polysaccharides, and that is glycogen. Okay, glycogen is a branched homopolysaccharide of glucose. So again, we have our glucose uh, molecule. It is a homopolysaccharide, so it means it is comprised only of glucose, but it is branched. Now, what that means is, is that typically it will form an alpha-1,4 linkage um, between these glucose molecules. However, around every 12-ish uh, residues, what's going to happen is that it will branch and it will go alpha-1,4 and alpha-1,6. And that's what we were looking at back here. Okay, this is glycogen, so it's typically an alpha-1,4, but it will then branch off to um, uh, via an alpha-1,6 linkage. Now, why is it beneficial for us to store glycogen as a branched helix? If space is a big concern here, it, it, surely it wouldn't make sense for us to, to branch them out via alpha-1,6 linkages. We'd be better off having it as alpha-1,4 all the way and just coil it right in on itself and really compress it and squeeze it right in. So why would we be trying to branch it out and, and take up even more space? Um, and, and basically the, the big reason here is, is that the osmotic gradient, the amount of osmotic pressure that the, such a, a large and highly condensed um, glycogen molecule would, uh, would, would generate uh, would cause the cell to explode. Um, so it's kind of a good thing that, that, uh, that we don't do that. Um, and yeah, this is why it sort of branches uh, uh, sort of quite frequently in these different residues. 
Now, looking at energy uh, storage, especially short-term energy storage, um, comparing animals to plants, which obviously I don't do um, very often. Let me do here. Um, but the equivalent for sort of plants would be starch. Um, so starch is a mixture of two different homopolysaccharides of glucose. We have amylose and amylopectin. So um, for those of you who, who aren't really aware, okay, uh, starch is seen, uh, you know, in like uh, potatoes, especially it's probably the biggest one that, that comes to, to mind. It's sort of quite sticky and, and gloopy. Um, and what we see here is that um, it, it is, uh, so amylopectin specifically, it is branched similar to glycogen. However, what we see is that it's not branched um, as frequently. So with glycogen, it's like typically around sort of eight to 12. Uh, with amylopectin, it's around 24 to 30. So um, it, it is a lot more uh, compressed than what we would see with, uh, with glycogen. Now, this looks uh, scary, would be the best way to put it. This looks very scary. This looks very overwhelming. And I would expect you to memorize these structures, okay? I would expect you to memorize the structure of uh, glycogen, of amylose, and amylopectin. Now, before we all panic and before we all freak out, let's remind ourselves what it is that we're looking at. So, amylose is just an unbranched alpha-1,4 polymer of glucose, Okay, so what that means is, is that if you know how to draw glucose, you're fine. If you know how to draw glucose and you remember that it is a alpha 1,4, that's all you need because all you need to do is draw glucose. So again, oxygen at the top right, draw your hexagon, CH2OH, down, up, down. Now this is an alpha 1, 4, so we were going to do an alpha. So we're gonna draw this uh, hydroxyl group down. One, four, sorry, let me zoom in a little bit. There we go. And then what do we do here? Well, let's redraw our hexagon. One, two, three, four, five, six. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. So again, big molecules like this, they look scary and looks like it's gonna be impossible to memorize, but all you need to do is have the structure of glucose memorized, which I've already suggested to you guys, you do need to know. And then all you need to do is just know what type of linkage we have here. So amylose is a um, non-branching uh, alpha 1,4, whereas amylopectin is uh, alpha 1,4, but it will branch at alpha 1,6. So if we're seeing this alpha 1,4, like what we've uh, got drawn over here, alpha 1,4, then alpha 1,4, and then what we have here is alpha 1,4 while also branching to an alpha 1,6. So that's an example of uh, that branching point of uh, alpha 1,4 and alpha 1,6 down here. Okay, next ones. Um, what we're going to do now is look at cellulose. Uh, when I don't need to sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so cellulose, what we see here is an unbranched homopolysaccharide of glucose. Well, hang on. We just did that. We just looked at this. That's amylose. But it's connected by beta 1,4 linkages. So the difference between uh, cellulose and amylose is that uh, cellulose is a beta 1,4 linkage. Now, these are very strong. These are very tough because of all the hydrogen bonds that can be established between them. Um, what is also interesting is that, well, I mean, some of you might find this interesting. Uh, we can't eat paper. We can't eat paper and we can't eat wood. I don't recommend you try. Please don't try to prove me wrong, okay? I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and the reason for that is, we don't have cellulase. We do not have an enzyme that is able to cleave these beta 1,4 linkages. Now, if it's alpha 1,4, yeah, man, 
Easy, happy days. We make this, yeah? We, we make this as glycogen and we use that as our short-term energy store in our body. Wicked. Beta 1-4? Nah, nothing we can do, sorry. Now, speaking of uh, Nile Red, uh, it was a few months ago now, he made a fantastic video on how to make moonshine. So for those of you who don't know what that is, moonshine is basically like bootleg alcohol, like very, very, very strong drinking alcohol, like uh, a, a typically upwards of 90% sometimes. Um, what he did was he made alcohol out of toilet paper. <laughs> which is so rad. He basically sourced cellulase and that enzyme chopped it up to make sugar and he then fermented it with yeast to create toilet paper alcohol. Uh, so I, I think it's on YouTube or I've got it on the portal um, somewhere there. Look, check it out for a giggle. I do think it is incredibly interesting that you've got paper, which we just can't do anything with because our GIT, our, our, our digestive tract can't break that down. So we cannot... Um, we cannot eat and absorb those uh, those glucose molecules because we can't cleave that beta 1-4 linkage. Uh, but anyway, getting getting a bit distracted here. Um, so this beta 1-4 unbranched homopolysaccharide of glucose, also known as cellulose, is incredibly abundant throughout all of uh, nature. And it is incredibly strong because of all of these various uh, parallel chains of, our, uh, of all these hydrogen bonds. So what we're seeing here, are these glycosidic um, linkages, we're seeing the connecting them, um, uh, all these different sugar molecules, and we can see a huge, just a huge amount of hydrogen bonding occurring between these uh, cellulose chains. Um, this is why something like uh, bamboo, uh, as, a, as a perfect example, is just so strong. And if you looked at it in terms of its size, uh, bamboo is actually stronger than steel. Uh, and, and indeed, I believe there are still places in Asia, don't quote me on this, there are still places in Asia that use bamboo to um, structurally support buildings while they're, while they're being constructed, which is, again, it's absolutely mind-blowing. Okay, the next one is chitin. Now, chitin is a linear, uh, whoops, sorry, is a linear homopolysaccharide of N-acetylglucosamine. So this is one of our variants here of, um, uh, of glucose. And what we see here is it is still a beta 1-4 linkage. Uh, it is very, very similar uh, to, uh, to cellulose. Uh, however, instead of sort of being found in plants, what we typically see with chitin is it is found in, um, in the cell walls of various fungi and mushrooms. Uh, and it's also seen in the exoskeletons of uh, insects. Uh, so when you sort of tread on a bug and you hear that crunch, this is what you're hearing um, sort of break. It's, these, it, it's this chitin. Okay, so now what we have done is we've been looking at these polysaccharides. We've been looking at um, various sugar molecules or various saccharides that are joined together in various different conformations to form various uh, macromolecules. <laughs> now, again, to just further complicate it, we then have what are called glycoconjugates. And this is when we have a sugar that is bound to something else that isn't even a sugar. So for instance, with a glycoconjugate, we can have a sugar that is connected to a protein, for example, or a sugar that's connected to a lipid. And again, I'm sure you've already learned about this uh, at various times throughout your, your studies, things like glycoproteins and glycolipids. Okay, these are our glycoconjugates here. It's a sugar bound to something else. Now, with our, uh, so again, a, a, an example here like glycoprotein, what this means is that we, it is predominantly a protein, but that does have a sugar part attached uh, to the end of it. And we uh, see this a whole lot on our lipid bilayer uh, and, it, and it's seen a whole lot in, um, in our cell cell signaling. Now we have a lot 
of these guys. And when I say a lot, I mean we have a lot. So if we look here at, uh, I believe this is a, a an electron microscope here of a of a cell, that is not static. What we are seeing here are various glyco conjugates that are being presented on the cell surface. And they have a huge wide variety of various functions like cell-cell interaction, cell-cell recognition, adhesion. Um, yeah, all sorts, all sorts of different stuff. Now, looking at our glycoproteins. So this is a protein that will have a, a sugar attachment to it. What can happen is we can have two main sort of subcategories of glycoproteins. We can have an N-linked glycoprotein or an O-linked glycoprotein. Now, an N-linked glycoprotein, what this is essentially doing is that um, we will have our, our uh, sugar uh, molecule, but it will be attached to um, either a serine or a threonine. Okay. And with our N-linked, it will be attached to asparagine. So that, that's kind of like the, the lock and key thing. It's kind of like how it will attach a sugar to, uh, to an amino acid. Uh, don't worry too much about getting super like bogged into the details of like N-linked and O-linked. I just need you to be aware that there are two different types of glycoproteins, uh, especially with respect to how they are connecting together. Now, looking at some examples here of these um, uh, oligosaccharides and these um, uh, and these glycoproteins, uh, one that I'm sure you've all definitely uh, learned about already is looking at erythropoietin. Okay, so erythropoietin (EPO) um, is is a is a growth factor that stimulates the production of uh, erythrocytes of red blood cells. Um, so what is that? Uh, so what our erythropoietin is doing is a glycoprotein that is being uh, released and will bind to and stimulate the production of red blood cells. Uh, another good example here of um, looking at our glycoproteins is blood type. So looking at our ABO blood typing. Um, so the the various. Um, uh, the, the various antigens that are being presented on the on the red blood cell surface, um, uh, these are various N and O linked glycans. So with our ABO blood typing, um, what's in, important to note is that the pre uh, presentation of uh, a particular um, glycoprotein can initiate a various response if it binds to an antibody. So uh, an, an example of that is that if we have... Um, blood type A, someone who has a blood type of A can only accept uh, blood from people who are also blood type A or blood type O. Now, the reason for this is it, it all comes down to what type of um, antigens and antibodies are made by that person. Because if we have an antigen and an antibody and they bind together, what's going to happen is it's going to trigger an immune response and it's going to activate your immune system and, you know, attack and destroy it. Now, obviously, that's not what we want to do with our, you know, with our blood. So we make sure that whatever um, antigens we have, we do not produce that antibody. So, for instance, if I have blood type A, I am going to um, express um, A but I will produce B antibody. If I have blood type B, I'm going to express B antigen, but um, produce the A antibody. If you are blood type AB, you are going to uh, have both um, A and B antigens um, on the red blood cell surface but you're not going to produce any antibodies. This is why people with blood type AB are referred to as the universal acceptor because they can accept any type of blood. It can be A, B, or O because they don't have any antibodies that could react uh, negatively with that. 
And we have blood type O, which are referred to as the universal donors, uh, because unfortunately they can only accept blood from blood type O. Okay, because they don't have any um, of the uh, A or B antigens, but they do produ uh, produce those as the antibodies. Now, uh, which is, uh, what we're also seeing too with um, with our, our glycans and with our, our polysaccharides here is that they also play a huge role in disease. Uh, they play a massive role, especially with viruses in how they are able to infect and gain entry inside of the cell, um, as well as, as bacteria, basically any kind of um, pathogenic uh, bacteria and, and how it can adhere and um, gain entry into uh, various organisms. Excuse me. Um, we also uh, have seen uh, many different patterns in terms of um, the presentation of various glycoproteins and things like cancer, uh, things like you know uh, growth uh, growth receptors uh, and stuff like that, so that it can um, release its own growth factor to bind to an overexpression of those glyco um, uh, of these glycoproteins on their cell surface. It'll bind to it and then trigger more and more cell replication, which is what we see in in um, in these cancer cells. It is an unregulated um, cellular division. Now, what this also means for us in terms of a medical research perspective is that if we know what receptor is being uh, overexpressed and is being overpresented on the cell surface, then that can be important for us in terms of intervention, in terms of us being able to, you know, can we find a, a, a compound that is very similar to the ligand that's supposed to bind to this, uh, to this glycoprotein and basically jam it and, and break or inhibit that receptor in the same way that we looked at enzyme inhibition. Very similar thing there. Uh, and that's that's basically what we're sort of seeing here. Like uh, it's been uh, quite a few years now uh, that we've, uh, they've been trying to use um, uh, monoclonal antibodies and try to develop sort of a vaccine. Um, oh, whoops, I'm not on screen, sorry. Uh, and, and find a um, sort of a, 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 a vaccine or a way to uh, trigger the immune system to activate and attack these these cancerous cells because your immune system doesn't do anything because it's self it's it's not a foreign uh, entity so your immune system doesn't try to target or try to attack it um, so what they're trying to do is basically um, take these um, uh, polysaccharides that are that are present on the cell surface of cancer cells, um, especially in a high high amount, um, and uh, get an antibody to bind to it uh, in the in the hopes of triggering a uh, a immune response. So that your your immune system will go, hey, well, these cells that are presenting all of these, we need to target and kill them. Uh, and it can be a way, again, to utilize your immune system to help destroy these cancer cells. Uh, I will... Uh-oh. Okay, cool. Uh, I will play that video in the shoot workshop as well. It is also on the um, Moodle page. It's also on the portal. Um, another thing too is that we um, can uh, use uh, this information for understanding um, and making new drugs, uh, making new medication in that we can uh, have a type of medication that can target and mimic the signal that, or, or the ligand that would bind to that um, uh, uh, polysaccharide and, and induce that same response uh, sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, it, it is a huge, huge, massive area of, of research, um, and it is so widely varied just because of the sheer uh, variation in terms of the uh, roles that uh, sugars and and carbohydrates play uh, in in the human body. All right, so, uh oh, wrong button. There we go. 
So guys, um, that is it for sugars. Nice and short and sweet compared to, to Enzyme. I know Enzymes was a, a little bit of a slog. Um, so guys, what the game plan is, we'll have a, a solid 15 minute uh, break, stand up, stretch your legs, grab some coffee. And what we'll do is uh, I will fire up Zoom and they, we will get started on our Tute workshop. So guys, thanks for tagging along and I'll see you guys uh, in a few minutes.